different way to think about all this. If you're, if you're doing this and trying to make money, your farmscaping should never cost you. It always pays you in many ways. All of these plants are multifunctional. Right. Loads of uses. Right. <clears throat> Back to broccoli again, because we did a lot of work on broccoli. Oh, the thing I got to tell you guys, the first year that we did that grant, we grew, harvested, and sold 21,753 pounds of broccoli. And I know because I cut just about every piece of it. Not all of it, but I did, there was 8,000 pounds I didn't cut. Jewel Morrow down, at, down by uh, Canton down there uh, cut 8,000 pounds of his. Now, I want to show you this because here's an old broccoli plant, or this could be one of your other crucifer plants, and it's got these parasitic wasp cocoons on it. If you till them under, you're going to kill them. So you can do one of two things. You could either take a row and leave it until the spring till you see the cocoons pop out, because what will happen is there will be a cocoon and the end will pop open. It will look just like a capsule that's just popped open. And then you know you can go on ahead and till that. Or you can do what I would do is I'd go around and just grab these, get a big bundle of them, and just go throw them up in a corner of the field, and then I could till everything else under. And when I was taking this picture, I was only looking at those cocoons there, and later on I noticed there's another mass of the same, this is uh, called Coetzea glomerata. This is the one that gets an imported cabbage worm and pops out of it like the alien all over. Okay. So, don't just think about what's going on right now. You've got to make that bridge between the end of this season and next spring. And if you keep these high populations, if you can ride herd on the first generation of these multi-generation insects, you got them whipped. If you don't have control of them in the first generation or so, then you're going to be playing catch up and spraying BT and neem or whatever, you know, to, uh, to control this stuff. Oh, I'm There's sorry. There's a thing I can... to consider here. It's a bit of a, a, bit of a, a, bit of a uh, paradox for us as growers because you're holding over that broccoli, right? <laughs> You're also probably holding over Alcanaria if you're a typical farmer around here. So what you want to do is pay attention. When you've seen that those beneficials have passed out and stuff, then you do get that residue, get it to your compost pile, get it hot, clean it up. You don't want that source of those spores later on when it gets hot and humid. Those guys are long gone by the time it's hot and humid. So you let it go early, but then you do clean it up. You know? But it used to be, I always believed, and it was like, it was a ritual every, every fall, totally clean the garden. Nothing left from the year before. Right, it's nice and clean. all bad stuff. Not true. It's a mix. Right. You just don't have black and white in the world. So you have to do that dance. You have to do that balance, you know. And then a few other great ones that likewise are wonderful arborists for overwintering insects are comfrey and yarrow. Yep. Because of their structure, those leaves, right, they lay, the way they layer, perfect place for both the, the pest and the beneficial. You have to get that. We're not saying... This is how you get rid of pests. You get rid of pests and you're in big trouble. You get, you want, you know, this is how you get your pests in control and balance. Right? You want to tip the scales in your favor, but you know, I am telling you, if you were growing commercially like we were doing, you know, what, uh, Charles was right. Charles, you know, in, Charles was right to have that field sprayed, even though we had gotten it all the way there you know, and proved to him. His wife was coming out to me uh, throughout the whole season and going and coming out and being really nice to me and going, would you like some tea? I feel so sorry for you because this is not going to work, you know. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. Dave, I got a surprise for you a little bit later on. And see, even as an organic grower, we always spray our broccoli once, you know. And we right. spray it right as it's cupping. That's right. Because the beneficials have a hard time getting inside the flower. And so you end up with gorgeous broccoli. Your plants look great. Boy, you aced it. And then your customers, your CSA members, this happened to me That's when right. I grabbed the spray once. Cook that broccoli, and there's a green worm in there, boy. It doesn't work. Right. You know? So once you do spray, it's not like we say never spray, but you learn when right. to dynamically use those sprays and not right. apply the beneficials of their, of their food sources and their nurseries so you have the next layer, the next um, generation of beneficials. And so he, he's making a really important point, and this is a trick that we use when you're, and, and I'm kind of focusing on broccoli here just because it was, you know, one of the things that we really worked on a lot. But when those plants cup, right when that head's a little button head, if you spray then, nothing can develop. It's two weeks from the time of, of you have a broccoli that's buttoned like that to the time it's like that. There's no caterpillars or anything that can develop that fast that I've ever seen, at least up where we are. Now, it's a little warmer down here, and you guys might have, you know, I mean, I'm up in, 
supposed to be the coldest spot in North Carolina. I don't know about that anymore. Okay, and the other reductionist thing that I'd say, because we're at these meetings and people are always wanting to know what percent, all right? Well, really, do as much farmscaping as you can do for the reduction people that I talk about, somewhere between one to five percent. And one of the things that we do and is commercially available are various uh, farmscaping mixes that you can drive over. So if you've got a takeout row, you've got a, you know, you've got a row every seventh or eighth row in a big field, for those of you that, are, that have big stuff, then you could take and make that your, your farmscaping and you didn't, you, you know, you didn't sacrifice any of your planting field for that. Okay. Two tricks that, um, that we use here, um, and Kenny Haynes actually, I love, he, on the bigger scale, he did it too. Um, what Kenny would do is, big farm, right, hundreds of acres, lots of rows that you hardly ever drive on. Once the crops are in there, there could be weeks and weeks before you drive on them again, right? He sowed them all the buckwheat. If he had to drive on, he drove over the buckwheat, killed some, put the stuff all in between groups. Then if he had a pest problem, what did he come to? Mow those rows. Where Everything the moves in. Sow into his fields. Right. What do we do here? We're sowing winter cover crops, right? We're mixing buckwheat into our winter cover crops. We always do. I mean, that's stupid, right? We're waiting and see. They're going to freeze. It's not going to work, right? But buckwheat this time of year, it goes to flower this tall. Right. You know? And so we have huge amounts of nectary, of food sources for our beneficials because we wasted a little bit of, quote, quote, wasted a little bit of our buckwheat seed. You know? And maybe a bunch of it will freeze and not get the flowers, so what? You know? Another trick that we've used with buckwheat, which Brinkley Benson taught us, was if you've got buckwheat up where it has two nodes and it's bloomed, you can weed eat it and then it'll bloom again. So we would have cut and come again buckwheat. It'd go bloom, we'd cut it, about three weeks later it'd bloom again, we'd cut it back down where it still had those two nodes. What do you say? Uh, well, let's see, we would put that stuff out actually in March, so the first bloom cutting would be 45 days later, you know, I mean, that's basically it. Now, you can, if you let it reseed, it'll just stay there, you know that. But, you know, and, and I don't think of buckwheat as too much of a weed, you know, I mean, it's one of the, it's easy to control. You can't control buckwheat, you've got some serious Yeah. Problems. Now, mugwort, you know, we can talk about yeah, some other, well, okay. And the other thing, too, to remember is if you've got ditches or fence rows or stuff like that, those all make great uh, harborage areas. And so here's where the rubber meets the road. Most insects that we're interested in as far as beneficials meet and mate at flowers. Flowers are the disco of the insect world, okay? So, you know, we, we see right here, you've got a mating pair of, this is Coetzea rebecula. This is another parasitic wasp that attacks um, imported cabbage worm. Where do we find them? We find them on brassica flowers, so we would always let a little bit of our broccoli go. People drive by and go, you let that roll of broccoli go. It's like, yes, we did that on purpose. Drive off, okay, but I'm gonna tell you something that we learned. This is where Virginia Tech and these other institutions have really come through. We were able to show that if you had a well fed mated female wasp, she would lay 10 times more eggs, 10 times more eggs than if she's poorly fed. So the same kind of problems that we have with pests where they lay eggs like crazy, we can turn around and take our beneficials and feed them real well and you don't have a normal wasp anymore. You've got a super wasp that will attack tons of pests in your field, way far beyond what most normal insects would, okay? And once again, you remember down here where we had that thing with the greenhouse where we use that to, to jumpstart our insects, okay? One of the other things that becomes really important, and we'll go out here shortly because we're just about at the end of this and see this in action out in the field is nectar. And I don't just mean nectar from flowers. I like tulip poplars. Now this, this is for the tiffia wasp that attacks Japanese beetles. We figured out that this tree was where we could collect these wasps and move these wasps, okay? <clears throat> so, as we said again, three to tenfold more eggs laid if these things have been fed well. Okay, so, and, and remember, it's not just flowers. 
these trees bloom out here. I've got a uh, holly, and the holly's blooming right now, and it's covered in beneficials. So there's all this, these shrubs and different things, and it, this is just a matter of observing, okay? So here's some of this work that I did in China. I went to China 12 to 14 times. I can't remember how many times I went. This is my buddy, Hung Yin, who worked with me at the uh, Beneficial Insect Lab in Raleigh. This is peanuts. When I got there, I thought they said it was red hemp. So of course, I'm a hippie. I thought I'd died and gone to heaven here, you know. But what this is is canaf, okay? This is canaf going all the way around the edge of this field. But this is a food plant for those tiffia wasps. And these guys would introduce a certain amount of wasps. They introduce one wasp to 10 grubs. They know how many grubs are in their fields. They introduce this with canaf and some other uh, food plants they have, like sweet potato. And we get control. Now, this is just the corner edge of the field. I just, you know, it comes out here bigger. But I just wanted to show you guys. Uh, those are nectar glands that are not associated with flowers. So they're extra floral nectaries, and a lot of plants have extra floral nectaries. Bachelor buttons has extra floral nectaries. Sweet potato, at the base of every sweet potato leaf, there's two little sugar nectaries. Vet, yes, any, a lot of your legumes. Yeah. It's, it's, so you grow your cover crop, you get the benefit of the cover crop, and you feed your beneficiaries. All right. <clears throat> pollen. We haven't talked about pollen yet. Pollen is extremely important. Certain beneficials cannot lay eggs unless they have fed on pollen. Surfid flies can't lay eggs unless they feed on pollen. So Patrick's trick is to put a lot of coriander out because it's just got pollen all in it. And you'll see these surfid flies just flying in and out like that. Okay. And sunflowers. And all right. A lot of composites are great for pollen. Indeed, I once ordered Oreos and Cidiosis from the new pirate club at the Thrips at the Highland Lake Inn. And they arrived. Jim was hiking. You know how he likes to hike, right? He was hiking. He didn't get a mail. And then there was the 4th of July. And by the time, because UPS always messes up with this. They always mess up. They didn't arrive for 10 days after I was supposed to get them, and my thrift population had crashed because that'll happen if you have as much diversity. And I'm like, I got $75 worth of Oreos and Sidiosis, and I got no food for them. I called up Jim saying, Time is all wrong. These guys are going to starve. And he's like, Do you have any flowers, Pat? I said, I don't flowers. I got, Do you have any fl flowers high in pollen? I said, Some flowers are covered up in pollen. You know, they, they actually breed ones not to have pollen, so it won't stain the tablecloths. You know? There's so much pollen on them. And he said, no problem. And I looked, and where were my Aureus and Sidiosis? All over the sunflowers. I think they're still there. If yeah. they're still growing flowers, they took because that's a bridge. You know, you, you can't count on controlling. If you're buying insects, you can't be sure that they're going to arrive when the prey that you want them for is still around because there are natural fluctuations. So what you want to do is have these bridges of pollen these other food sources, because they can all just switch. They're all pinch hitters. Another uh, pest that was at Highland Lake that Patrick was able to control was Western flower thrips. They, those guys would put this presentation with their plates where they were using lily flowers and some other flowers. And, and also there were aphids in there. And by farmscaping and getting these beneficials in there, they were having to wash that stuff three times before farmscaping. And then afterwards, they just washed it once just to make sure it was clean and put it on the plate. So uh, we're just kind of giving you examples over and over again. Here's a surfid fly in Cosmos. Sell so Cosmos at the market. Feed my surfid flies in, in, the, in the garden, OK? Now, the other trick that you need to know, when you look at these, these insects, I'm basically going to tell you is if it's really tiny, it doesn't move very far. If it's a fly, it can go wherever it wants. And if they're bigger, they go wherever they want. All right. So depending on the type of pest you're trying to control, if you're trying to control aphids you, and you're using a little tiny parasitic wasp, they've shown genetically now that if you had a colony of aphid wasps in this field and a half a mile down the road, there's another colony, those two are genetically separate. Because it's a huge, you know, if you put that on a relative scale, that'd be like 20 miles. So it's very important what we learned out of that when I read these papers is how important it is that you have your own population locally that you're keeping healthy so that they don't have to travel real far. And so that's one of the reasons, if you saw earlier, where we said lots of food plants spread out all over the place is way better 
than one big clump unless you're dealing with surfeits because surfid flies are like helicopters. So we could put a little patch in the corner of the garden over here of umbels and maybe some of that false dandelion stuff, multiple bloom, king devil, and a few other things, and they cover the entire field. If you're using these little tiny wasps, though, you know, you're using these low dispersion. You have ground beetles and ladybugs when they're happy, and then your smaller parasitic wasps, okay? Now you have medium dispersion, which means they're going to move about a quarter of a mile, which would be from here up to the end of that field over there. And those are most parasitic wasps. Those are the ones that I showed you pictures of earlier, those coatsy ones that make the cocoons. That's about as far as they like to go. 